Okay, so before we talk about species and speciation, we kind of need to talk about the history of life, which really begins with the beginning of our uni universe, right? So about um, um, 10 to 20 billion years ago, we had uh, the current theory, or the Big Bang Theory, is that um, all mass, all um, elements of life were concentrated at one point and uh, something set off a big bang which then caused the coalescing of these points uh, of the the mass into elements and then compounds and then um, that is what comprises our universe um, at about four and a half billion years ago the earth formed as a hot mass of molten rock um, and began to start uh, circling the the sun water came from comets that pelted the earth and as these comets hit the earth because it was molten rock it would melt and form um, pools of water the moon um, also formed from a collision uh, from a collision of a large protoplanet about four billion years ago um, which sent a bunch of material into uh, or above the Earth's atmosphere and coalesced to form the moon. Life began um, shortly after the moon, well not shortly, seven million years after the, uh, the moon was formed, between 3.8 3 and 3.5 billion years ago. Um, the current theory for that is called spontaneous generation, where um, accumulations of macromolecules formed from prokaryotic prokaryotic organisms in the ocean's edge or during within hydrothermal deep sea vents or elsewhere. Um, the evidence for this is really hard to compile because it happened you know, 3.8 billion years ago um, and we have to rely on fossilized evidence but there is some experimental evidence to support this theory including an experiment done by Miller and Urey in 1953 and what they did is they assembled this apparatus which um, approximates the conditions of the earth about 3.5 billion years ago they have very hot boiling water they have uh, electric shock representing you know lightning or other events um, and then they have the water condensing going back to earth so um, they put elements within this water similar to the Earth's ocean, ocean at that time and then they let it go through many different cycles and then would check every once in a while for what was in the water after it had gone through these cycles. Um, what they found was not life, they didn't get life to spontaneously generate, but they did get 30 carbon compounds including some amino acids. Okay which are building blocks for proteins or building blocks for life as we know it. So there's some experimental evidence. A lot of this also um, remains to be discovered. But the fossil record does tell us uh, good approximations for when life um, occurred and when life, how life progressed through time as far as the species and their different life forms. Um, fossils are aged using half-lives of isotopes. So isotopes, um, there are different isotopes of the same elements. They will over time decay from one element to another. Um, when that, when those fossils are formed, those isotope, isotopic um, uh, ratios um, can be determined and from that you can determine how old a rock is. Uh, the oldest known prokaryotic organisms are from fossils are 3.5 billion years ago so we think sometime before that um, you had life in the form of cells beginning. Okay so up here on the timeline we're at about here. All right, continuing though, from there, at about two billion years later, you had eukaryotes forming uh, about 1.5 billion years ago, okay, through the process of endosymbiosis, which we studied last semester. 
At about one billion years ago, multicellular organisms formed, and that allowed for differentiation of different um, tissues and um, morphological adaptations to their environment, and also uh, a more uh, pronounced, more usage of sexual selection for reproduction, which led to more variety in organisms. Um, and thus a, a diversity of organisms. So at, in another um, about 500 million years, animals and plants started to um, establish and are found in the fossil record and began to radiate extensively during the Cambrian period. And this is referred to as the Cambrian explosion or Cambrian radiation. Um, and from there we got very uh, many of the different um, ancestors of modern-day invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, and invertebrate life, however, dominated the landscape for uh, many millions of years after that. Um, now, life has gone through many different fluctuations which coincide with fluctuations in the Earth, in its temperature, in its um, atmospheric composition and carbon dioxide and oxygen specifically changes in the land masses um, so Pangea uh, about 200 million years ago we had all of the continents um, combined to form one mega continent called Pangea now they are separated into um, smaller continents and all of these changes uh, change the environment of course and then that would lead to uh, speciation events or the evolution of new species. All right, so that leads us into the origin of species. So first, the concept of a species has to account for two phenomena. First, the distinctness distinctiveness of species that occurred together at a single locality. So what makes them a species? What makes one over the other? So here we have three different sparrows, they morphologically or on externally look pretty similar. But well, what makes them distinct? Our definition of a species must take that into account. Also, it must account for the connection that exists among different populations belonging to the same species. Yeah. So, there's another example. These are fox squirrels that have different variations, um, but these all constitute the same species. So how can these be the same species and how are these not the same species? That must be included in our definition. And we, we have talked a little bit about this when we introduced macroevolution and some of the barriers to reproduction which helps create species. We're going to really expound on that in, in our conversation of species now. So species um, include Sympatric species, these are different species which occur in the same to get same space and time, so um, together. So for example, here are four different types of squirrels. So you have a flying squirrel, you have a gray squirrel, a fox squirrel, and this is a woodchuck or a marmot. You can see I've seen a few of these around town. These are all in the same family of squirrels and live in the same, can live in the same area, but are different species. Um, you can tell they are characteristically different. They're different in size, different in um, specializations, such as these uh, gliding structures on this flying squirrel. Um, they're different in color, and they also utilize different parts of the habitat and behave separately. So even if they do look similar to us as humans, they have mechanisms and ways to recognize um, members of their species and members of other species. So sympatric species avoid mating with members of the wrong species in a variety of ways. We've kind of talked about these before. Um, there can be visual signals such as coloration, sound production. So there's uh, an example of your book of these bugs 
which are morphologically very similar but produce different um, calls and by those calls they can identify different species. Similarly different species of frogs um, that overlap in certain areas have different mating calls or we'll call at different times and those different mating calls will prevent them from mating with each other. They may also have chemical signals such as pheromones or electrical s signals such as electro um, which can then be sensed through electroreception. Within species, you may also have subspecies, which are individuals in populations that occur in different areas, but and they may appear to be distinct, but are exact, actually part of the same species. So an example is the subspecies of rat snakes, which occur up and down the uh, eastern north eastern United States. Um, they morphologically look different in their coloration. Um, so in Virginia, we might see this uh, black rat snake, whereas down in Georgia, you might see this gray rat snake. Um, and so these are all different subspecies. However, uh, they do interbreed uh, within the borders of their geographic regions. So that gene flow uh, prevents them from becoming different species. The biological species uh, concept, as defined by Ernst Mayer, if you remember, is that groups of species are actually defined by their ability to reproduce. So if you can mate with another population, um, then you are, in fact, the same species and produce viable offspring. Um, here are a bunch of different salamanders which occur in uh, California which are reproductively isolated, so they are separate species. All right, so through reproductive isolation, you can achieve um, separate species. All right, so um, one example of, of how reproductive isolation causes species is through cladogenesis, where you have one ancestral species dividing into two or more descendant species. If these species are defined by the existence of reproductive isolation, then the process of speciation is identical to the evolution of reproductive isolating mechanisms. So, for example, in cichlid fish in Lake Victoria, there are modifications of their jaws, which allowed them to um, specialize in different areas within the lake geographically, which led to their reproductive isolation. So by identifying um, how they um, separated themselves um, geographically and then reproductively, you can determine how they became species. So some forces of speciation include selection, okay, which can reinforce other isolating mechanisms. So the formation of a species is a continuous process. So once you have species formed, it's not necessarily uh, going to remain that way. And it may diverge more or coalesce back to a, a different point. Two populations may only be partially reproductively isolated, okay, and then reinforced through natural selection after partial isolation. Um, reinforcement is not n inevitable, so it's not necessarily going to occur. Um, such as when hybrids may be inferior, inferior but still fertile. These hybrids then can serve as a conduit of genetic exchange. So through um, there are different types of flycatchers, pied flycatchers which occur in northern Europe, colored flycatchers which occur in southern Europe, and there is an area of um, hybridization which occurs between these two um, flycatchers but they are less fit generally than the two counterparts. Um, and so this hybridization is a reinforcement e event to make these species not separate, but in fact, the same. So genetic drift, we talked about um, uh, the founder effect and bottleneck effect, which were random changes, which can also cause reproductive isolation. So especially in genetic drift and the founder effect, 
and, and the bottlenecks create these smaller populations with um, a much smaller gene pool. Uh, so this also may reinforce uh, differences in genes which can uh, isolate um, populations reproductively. Um, an example of this in the Hawaiian Islands, the Drosophila, which are fruit flies, they differ in their courtship behavior even though their ancestor was probably a descendant of uh, a mainland Drosophila. Um, so those changes in courtship behavior because you have a smaller pool of genetics probably occurred because you have a smaller population. Adaptation can also lead to speciation. So as populations of species adapt to different circumstances, they are likely to accumulate many differences that may lead to reproductive isolation. So an example of this is a species of lizard which occurs in um, islands throughout the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean Sea. Um, so they have changes, they had changes in their dewlaps, which is this um, part of their neck which extends out, helps them attract mates. Okay, and these would change depending on the environment that they live in. So if you're in an environment that has lots of red flowers, this red dewlap probably isn't going to help you stick out for, for a mate. Okay, so it may have changed to more of a yellow or grayish or orange or selected for that color. All right, so this reproductive isolation due to these different colors led to speciation. All right, so speciation is a two-part process. First, you have to have divergence of populations. The second part is you have to have reproductive is isolation to maintain those differences. And if you have the homogenizing effect of gene flow, so if you do have somehow these populations connecting, that's going to um, reduce those differences. Re speciation is more likely and more logically thought of as um, occurring through geographically isolated populations. So allopatric, allopatric speciation is uh, exactly that. Um, when populations, when some sort of um, geographical event or geographical barrier prevents different populations from breeding. Um, an example is the little paradise kingfisher, which varies um, very little throughout its range on the mainland, but when you put it on an island um, such as New Guinea and it has this mountain range, um, you get isolated populations of these kingfishers which have um, morphological difference quite distinct from the rest of the mainland population of kingfishers. Okay, so because they are separated physically by a geographical barrier, um, their, their reproductive, reproductively isolated and so they um, start to adapt to that habitat more and more differences accumulate. All right, sympatric speciation is a little more abstract. It's where one splits into two, one species splits into two species at a single locality. So there isn't a geographic barrier preventing them from um, interbreeding. It's something else that has to create the, the, the separation. So one type occurs commonly as the result of polyploidy or events which cause a duplication in the uh, chromosome number. There are two types of polyploidy. First is autoploidy, which is where all the chromosomes arise from the same species and an error in cell division produces a tetraploid. Okay, a tetraploid cannot produce fertile offspring uh, with normal diploids because they would have, you would have a haploid gamete and a diploid gamete and they would produce a triploid organism. So that would be a means of reproductive isolation 
Now, allopolyploidy is where two species hybridize, resulting in offspring that have one copy of the chromosomes of each species. And that um, by itself cannot um, reproduce sexually, but if another polyploidy event occurs where those chromosomes double, now you can um, make fertile gametes through the process of meiosis. So allopolyploidy relies on um, hybridization and then a polyploidy event. So sympatric speciation may occur over the course of multiple generations through another process called disruptive selection, where individuals exhibit two different phenotypes. Okay, the phenotypes evolve reproductive isolating mechanisms, and then the phenotypes retained as a polymorphism or um, different uh, morphological characters within a single population. Okay, so you may have a bird which um, colonizes different areas, uh, different islands. Those um, islands then have different selective pressures and would, you would have different um, species on those islands. And that can result in different adaptations within those islands. Um, and then the colonization of those um, species back to these other islands. So you, then you would have different species on all three islands. So after you have your, your evolution specific to that island, a reproductive event would occur. Or may result in colonization of the islands, and then the species evolves different adaptations within those specific islands and that would be uh, character displacement, which we'll talk about later. All right, adaptive radiations are closely related species that have recently evolved from a common ancestor by adapting to different parts of the environment, much like we described um, with this figure. So it occurs in an environment with few other species and many resources. Okay, so um, this occurred with the Hawaiian and Galapagos Islands where the species from the mainland was probably um, of the finches, was probably under a lot of competition from other species and had a very small amount of resources that it specialized in. But once it colonized the new islands, there was a vast array of resources it was available to um, take part of. Um, and then it was able to radiate from there and, and specialize in the different types of resources. So character displacement um, also occurs when natural selection in a species favors individuals that use resources not used by other spe species. And that will increase their fitness, increase their ability to survive and reproduce. This, these differences in trait will then increase in frequency over time and the species will diverge. All right, so these large scale evolution of species rather than just populations um, over time, there are two different theories for how or how frequently, I guess, this, these speciation events occur. The first one is gradualism, where these accumulation of really small changes results in a standard amount of speciation over time. The second one is called punctuated equilibrium, where it's long periods of stability followed by rapid change and then stability again after that. So these punctuated or short periods of time in which you have radiation events followed by stability after that. Um, both of them are kind of the extremes of a continuum. Uh, actually it occurs a little bit of both. So um, 
depending on the species, resources, environment, everything else, you may have punctuated equilibrium for some areas, and you may have gradualism in others, or a combination of the two. Alright, so that's it for speciation.